Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, former drummer of the Black Crows and talk radio host, Steve Gorman. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another episode of the Rich Redman Show. Yeah, I got my co-host. We're coming from two cities today. As always, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com coming to us from Spring Hill, Tennessee. I'm coming from, sad, it's not that sunny today, but beautiful West Hollywood, California. And I am really excited about today's guest. He's got a brand new book out and he's the founding member of the American classic rock band, The Black Crows. Of course, I'm talking about my new friend, Steve Gorman. What's up, Steve? Somebody. Uh, <laughs> I'm I, late I, on the applause. West, Here we go. West Hollywood this time of year is not bad. I got I to gotta be honest. I, I got to tell you, yeah. Well, you lived in L.A. for a while. I counted the cities you, you lived in. It was like seven cities or so over the course of your life. Are you digging Nashville? Oh, yeah. Well, I've been here 16 years now. Wow. And, and I, I, when I got here, it was to stay. You know, I grew up in, in uh, Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And then I spent three years in college in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So I knew Nashville in the 80s very well. Nashville is where I went to concerts and took, caught a flight on the, on the odd occasion. So you had to be here to do anything worthwhile. So um, no, we moved here in 04 and, and said, you know, that's it. This is the last move. So it's been, and that's been great. I mean, 16 uh, years. Before it, I, wow. I will say this long before I lived in Nashville, I did. And I just, re- I was just thinking about all my Thanksgivings uh, oh, when I wasn't home. And one of those was in 1993 and I spent Thanksgiving dinner at Cantor's Deli in L.A., which yeah. did a fine spread. If, you, if you're still there on Thursday and, you know, if you're out of luck and got nowhere to, nowhere to go and no one to cook for you, you know, it's, it's, an, un, it's an unsolicited uh, hearty recommendation for the Thanksgiving spread at Cantor's. Nice. I have, ki- I have kibitz there many nights. And, and on oh, yeah. Tuesday nights, I don't, I don't know how far it goes back, that there's a house band there that plays for four hours straight and they don't stop. And the only musician that really changes is there'll be like 10 drummers that want to sit in over the course of <laughs> yeah. four hours. And the band just keeps playing. And then someone just grabs a drumstick and just sits down. But the, they sure. just play. It's incredible. It's really hilarious. Uh, I've not, I've not caught that. That that's obviously after well after my time. <laughs> well, well, the book is fantastic. I consumed it in one sitting. It's called "Hard to Handle: The Life and Death of the Black Crows," a memoir by by Steve mm-hmm. Gorman. And there's the book. They're like a little Star Wars treatment for you. I got it on the iPad. Um, how did that come about, man? Because I mean, you're kind. I mean, you're a little young actually to write a memoir. I always say to myself, if you're under sixty, you're a little. You're early, but you had probably so many stories that just had to be written down. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote about three times what ended up in the final version of the wow. book. Um, I spent a long time, uh, well, you know, the I started the, I joined a band called Mr. Crow's Garden in 1987. Wow. That band became the Black Crows in 1989, and then our last tour was 2013. And it exploded in the spring of 2014. So about 27 years where I said regularly, I'd write the book, but nobody would believe it. Wow. Um, you know, and, and, and it was always like kind of a shtick or it was the joke among the band. People would say, well, Steve, you're going to have to write the book. You're the, only, you're the only one that remembers anything. You know, that was always <laughs> kind of a half serious, half joke around thing. But uh, when, when the band did stop in 2014, when it was obvious that it was over, uh, at that time, it's, you would think it would have been over for everyone. It was clearly over for me. I, I would have never said then, yeah, I'm going to write a book about this. It was just too ugly and too painful and too embarrassing and too silly. And all those things that, that at the time certainly get in the way in the grand scheme of things. Of a, I never wanted to write a book that was anything but full. I wanted to be at a place where I understood all of it and where I could say I accept this and it's over. You know, I would have never written a book if I had any, if there was a percentage of a percentage point that I would ever return to the music or to the band, the Black Crows, I should say. I didn't want to write a book that was angry or bitter or, or, or anything. I just, so it would have never occurred to me to write a book because at the time I stayed really busy but there was anger and there was shock and there was bewilderment, you know, and I, I, I thought the band should be over just the way it went down was such a distressing thing. Yeah. That said, 
uh, luckily, after a few years, uh, get away from that and things do start to fall into place. Our, our longtime uh, keyboardist, Eddie Harsh, passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. And when that happened in the end of 2016, uh, it just sort of, within a few months of his death, I really did one day, it was, uh, it was almost like there was a day when I finally recognized, oh, I've been ignoring the fact that this whole story makes sense to me now. Like it's settled. It's just, I felt like everything I thought and felt about what happened with that band, good, bad, and ugly. Yeah. I got it. I fully understood it. I accepted it. It made sense. I was never going to look at it any differently. You know, it was like, it's like I had enough distance and I thought this is a pretty fucking crazy story. And you know, I, I think I probably would like to tell this story. And, and there was, you know, a little bit of, there's so much misinformation. There's such a mythology that was built around the band or a sensibility that was created mostly by our singer that really no one else in the band understood or agreed with. You know what I mean? And it was yeah. the kind of thing of, you know, when Ed died, I just felt a lot of emotions. And one of those was, well, I'm really not interested in my version of events not being out there. You know what I mean? Like Ed died and no one knows where yeah. his head was. No one got Ed Harsh's story. And I yeah. thought, well, I'd like my story to be told. Um, well, and it you, is I my mean, story. Sure. It's not, it's not, the, it's not the, it's not a history of the black crows. It's just my, it's my story. It's a story yeah. of a dysfunctional ba- uh, family, but there is yeah, love. Very much so. There is love. Um, there, and, <laughs> yeah. and it's coming through your eyes and you deserve, and you deserve and earned every right to tell the story. 27 years is a hell of a run. I mean, my, I've been with this, playing with the same guys for 21 years. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And it just flies by five presidencies. Um, wow. Yeah. I, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I listened to the, uh, the Eddie trunk interview and uh, what's the, what has the reaction been? Are people enjoying the book? Are you getting, yeah, I think it's been, I mean, the, mail? Hard, <laughs> no, the, hard, the hardback is out. Oh, it's been over a year now, you know, yeah. the paperback came out in May, but the, the, the original, you know, the, it came out last September. So yeah. there has been, um, the, uh, you know, the, the only people that seem to have a problem with it are a certain faction of black crows fans. It's not easy to read a, You know, when you just love a band and you've decided, you know, these people and somebody comes along and, and, challenges or destroys that perception it's not easy but i think the vast majority of people who've read it can see it for what it is which is it's a story about people and they happen to be in a band more than anything else you know that's that's really just the context i mean the sopranos is about yeah they're in the mafia but there's a lot more going on there you know what i mean it's like uh and i saw it that when i was writing it i i certainly wanted that to be the vibe um you know, that's how I always looked at it. I mean, when a bunch of, you know, I was 21 years old when I met the Robinson brothers and I was the old man, you know, I was the only one who could buy beer. And the three, you know, they had already obviously were playing music together. They're obviously brothers, but I was the first person to step into the room and go, okay, I'm, I'm in, I'm doing this for real. They're committed to that, to a band with them. And by the time we became the black crows, it was, so far past the point of turning back for any of us, you know, we were, we were very committed and in those early years, there's so much emotion and so much heart and so much denial of reality. Cause you better be able to deny some reality or you'll never get out of bed that in the morning when you're trying to figure out that landscape of the music industry and you don't really want to know how it works, but you don't want to be left in the dark. You know, you're trying to, you know, who are we? Are we artists or are we rock stars or are we just guys avoiding day jobs? What, you know, uh, we weren't having linear conversations about those things, but that's what you're, that's 20, 21, 22 years old for me is trying to figure all those things out. But thank and God, then by the you time, had the, yeah, you had an amazing platform. And I, from what I understand, you had an amazing m- manager, a visionary manager for many years. Well, once, once the record, yeah. And, and, you know, we, we got the record made without him. We, we had an amazing producer and then we got an amazing manager and without the efforts of both those guys, without the talents and the ambition and motivation and all the hard work of both George Draculius, who signed us and produced our first two albums. And then Pete Angelus, who managed the band from, you know, we met him two months before Shake Your Moneymaker was put in stores. We met our manager. Yeah. Um, you know, that's not normal. You know, usually right. you've got, uh, you're in the trenches for years like with a couple someone. years of yeah. trying to work the system and somebody telling you how it's going to go and showcases and all. We had none of that. 
So we were coming from the rear of the pack as soon as our record hit the stores, you know, uh, radio and, you know, jealous again, got a bunch of radio play right out of the gate, which blew yeah. our minds. Um, and Pete Angelus showed himself very quickly to be a, phen a phenomenal manager, you know, a great business mind, but also an incredible creative mind. He was in every way imaginable the sixth member of the band and you could argue that he was the most important member of the band in those first few years because he was the one with the vision and the understanding of what the hell we were trying to do and how to get it done yeah well i'm a, i mean i'm a that record holds up and we were just talking this last february was a celebration of 30 years the 30 year anniversary of that record yeah. and of course i had it on cassette and was driving around when it came out i was driving around a uh a maroon Toyota pickup truck loading my drums in and out of nightclubs in Lubbock, Texas, while I was trying to get my music degree. And we were kind of talking off camera. And I was like, you really had the great business plan because in college, I was trying to get my tens of thousands of hours together so I can go join a rock band. And you just said, I'm going to join a rock band. I'll, I'll get my 10,000 hours in as I am a rock star, which is an amazing business plan. Awesome. Well, I, I wasn't <laughs> thinking of it in terms of being a rock star. I did think, you know, I, I, you know, like as an athlete in high school, I was okay in practice, but I was all about the game. You know, yeah. I, mean? I was all about, you know, Saturday morning, those soccer games, that meant everything. Basketball, I was like, yeah, practice is fine, but let's let's get some people in here and pop up some popcorn and see what happens. Yeah. And so, you know, all the bands that that really, I mean, I grew up obsessed with the Beatles and, you know, and and, and all the, and a ton of great music. I'm the youngest of eight kids. So there was a lot of records wow. in my house. I had... You know, I had Al Green records and Yes records and Earth, Wind and & Fire records and The Doors and all kinds of things to listen to. I was totally into New Wave. You know, punk was cool, but I didn't have a lot of access to real punk rock. But New Wave, you know, when you turn on SNL and there's Devo and the B-52s, you know, to my 8th, ninth, 10th grade brain, I was like, okay, I don't know what any of this is, but I'm in. You know, I yeah. just loved it. And so when I started going to see bands and clubs, you know, that was right away. I was like... I played a drum kit when I was in high school. I sat behind a kit for the very first time in high school and I knew I could play. I just always had a sense. And my buddy Clint Steele had a kit in his room and he had headphones next to a stereo. And I sat down and I started playing a beat and he goes, here, play along to this. And he put on cashmere by Led Zeppelin, which <laughs> actually right out of the gate is a pretty good one to drum along to just yeah. at least initially. It's pretty simple, Yeah. but I was doing that. And, and I, you know, I, was a, I think I was a senior in high school and right away I went, oh, I knew I could do this, man. I got this. But to me, it was all about doing it. I didn't want to be in a bunch of bands and work my way through it. It was kind of like when the right band comes along, when I meet the right people, I'll do this and I know I'll be, I know I'll be good at this. It was just a bizarre, I, I don't know what that was. It was no, you had a crystal ball of always. confidence there, man. I definitely. Yeah, I did, but I, I, say. You know, I, didn't, I didn't want to kind of waste time with some, you know, with people that, that weren't, I, I just needed it to be the right fit. Sure. I couldn't have described what that was, but I figured I'd know it when I saw it. And so yeah. it, it did, it did work out. You know, I did know it was just a matter of me buying a drum kit and sitting down and really focusing on it. And I'll, I'll fit it. I'll, you know, I'll be okay in that regard if I'm in the right band. Cause it was always about a band to me. It wasn't about being in bands. It was about being in a band. I had yeah. to find my band and then we'd be good to go. That was always the, that was always the goal. It was to, you know, put together my own little basketball team, except for playing music, you know? For sure. Now, speaking of that beat, so the cashmere beat, yeah. Jim, you know the cashmere beat, because Jim plays a little drums. He still plays drums, but then he did radio for 20 years. And now, he's a, now he's a voiceover guy. 15 years later, you played that with Jimmy Page. Or was it 20 years yeah. later? It was, uh, well, it was 12 years later. I bought my first kit in the spring of 87. Yeah. And we toured with him in 99. Um, we did not, however, play Cashmere, but we played a whole bunch of other Zeppelin songs. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was pretty awesome. The first time he sat in with us was in 1995. And um, so I guess I'd been playing at that point for eight years. Yeah. And uh, that, was, that was pretty great. <laughs> I mean, that's, you, know? I mean the, you really, that was, a, that was the fast track, man. That is so cool. And you know when people mention, you know, the Black Crows, immediately a drummer will sit down and go, God, God. Do God. And, it, yep. and it makes me think, I mean, you have penetrated the consciousness of drummers. That was an old Otis Redding song, right? That your producer mm -hmm. was yeah. like, George was like, 
we're going to do this old soul song. And you guys are like, what? It's like a B side of all B sides. Like, and he's like, no, this is going to be a single. And it's so funny that when like a lot of, I'll sit down and I'll play that beat for three and a half minutes to get drum sounds in front of house. And people immediately start going. Da, 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 da. It, it, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Every cover well, band uh, in the country cool in the nineties played it. <laughs> yeah. They're still playing. Yeah. I, um, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. That, I mean, it is funny that that's how that worked out because George suggested an Otis Redding song. He didn't say which ah, one. Nice. Because that first box set had come out in the either end of 88 or early 89. There was an Otis Redding box set, and we were just listening to it all the time. Uh, and, you know, we're, in, we're making our first record, Summer of 89, and it's, you know, Georgia Band, and we all love Otis. And George yeah. just said, man, we should do an Otis song. That'd be cool. Um, I suggested Hard to Handle because we didn't want to do, like, you don't do Try a Little Tenderness or Dock of the Bay or something everybody on earth knows. <laughs> and there was also a bit of a pedigree. You know, the Grateful Dead had done Hard to Handle. Tom Jones had done it. A few other significant artists had covered it over the years. So it didn't feel like a crazy idea to throw our own thing on it. What George did was, as we were trying to figure it out, you know, the Otis writing's really swinging. That's Booker T and the MGs playing it. And we weren't those kind of players yet. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I would never say I'm, I'm Al Jackson to this day, but the way they played it, we just didn't have that in the, in the, in the, you know, in the pouch yet. So he said, just make it straight. And he said, you know, walk this way, like Aerosmith it, like, you know, and, and, we just found that groove right away. And that was we just were the all, beat. I we all playing. found it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way yeah, our, I, I mean, just with the just bass a, riff, <laughs> our, our heads just started nothing, bopping. Nothing <laughs> overthinking at all. But, you know, and when we were looking for the arrangement, you know, George is the one who said, start on the drums. And the farthest thing from my mind was, oh, cool. This will be something. Because as you alluded to, we all just assumed this was going to be a B-side. It never dawned on us this would make the final the album. hit. Much less be a single. Yeah. yeah. Do you still get a so kick out of hearing the, yourself on the radio? Hang on one sec. Yeah. Making sure the dogs were fed. It's yeah, important yeah. stuff around here. <laughs> Who let um, the dogs, dogs out? <laughs> um, yeah, of course. I mean, it's always cool. I don't, I, don't get a, I don't get a kick out of it like, oh, I, I really don't think like, oh, yeah, all right, right on, man. Uh, it has nothing to do with me. It's almost like I'm hearing a different person or a different band. I, but, but what I get a kick out of is I, I don't listen to Black Crows records. I mean, if you play a song uh, by the Black Crows, I haven't heard it in a long time, almost always, you know, but it's, and I'll hear it and go like, oh, that's pretty good. You know, like, all right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm glad to know that still holds up. It's more like that than, uh, oh, than that getting record, a rush. That record holds up, radio. man. Wow. That holds up. A good I mean, old rock record, man. It's just I mean, how many times we're in the car, if, you know, if I'm flipping channels, you know, Sirius XM nineties or something. And I hear it, I'll crank it up just to make my kids roll their eyes back to the you know, back of their head. <laughs> they never remind think them that cool. their dad used to be cool, but they couldn't care less. Of course. <laughs> oh, my, they don't my kids, my kids, my kids used to hear my voice on the radio and they'd be like, eh. And then an yeah. odd thing, I, they heard me on television for a, a, um, a personal injury attorney. I did the tag for it. On TV, <laughs> and they come out and they go, dad, we, we just heard you on TV. I'm like, yeah, Oh, now it's a time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, they're, my kids are 20 and 18 now, so they, they actually do think it's pretty, you know, they, they get it from a different perspective, but there's a time, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, early teens, mm. it's just like, oh God, stop dad. You know? So of course I, I have to rub it in their face just yeah. to drive them that much crazier. And what have you done yet? <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, what's your I mean, connection that's... with, uh, with, with the uh, radio and broadcasting? I mean, you've, you've had several shows. You have a show currently still, right? Steve Gorman rocks on Westwood one or. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I mean, to go back to the beginning, I was a broadcasting major in college. I ah. planned to be a sportscaster originally. Um, <clears throat> uh, and that, thought ended the second I dropped out, you know, and I moved to Atlanta, bought a kit and I never looked back. But in the mid 2000, 2005, 2006, you know, the Crows were on tour all the time. And I would, well, this actually goes back to the late nineties. I would go do a lot of radio hits. You know, I'd be, we'd be in town. And if the show wasn't sold out, somebody would say, go to the rock station and talk up the gig. And so you know, I could speak in complete sentences. I knew how not to cuss. So I was a good candidate for those things. Ah. 
And uh, by the late 90s, sports talk was taken off. And so I'd be at a rock station and I'd do my 20 minutes with the DJ and I'd be walking down the hallway and across, you know, down there'd be another studio, it'd be a sports station. And I would always say, hey, can I sit in with those guys too? Just because I'm a huge sports fan. And, yeah. and so I did that over the, over the years. And I, this little seed was definitely planted in the back of my head. I started listening to like Jim Rome and various nationally syndicated sports guys. And I would say, I would think to myself, man, there's something there for me. I don't know what it is yet, but it was not unlike drumming where I just had this really vague idea. And over a few years, it just started making more sense. I started putting together. It was really once I moved to Nashville um, because the, certainly a lot of the country people I met were crazy sports fans. It was an easier to, easier to have a sports conversation with the average country musician than a lot of rock guys. Yeah. And so um, I was just doing some locals. I'd sit in with the local guys here on the afternoon drive station in Nashville, the, the 104.5 The Zone. And, you know, I had done that a bunch. And the, it was as simple as they asked if I wanted to do a weekly segment, like commit to a weekly bit. Yeah. And my answer was, well, I'd really just rather have my own show. <laughs> and and, and the, the pro- I that said happen? that to the program director. And he goes, really? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, what is it? And I go, it's musicians talking sports. And obviously, Nashville, Tennessee, you can say that and people don't throw something at you. He went, yeah, yeah okay. That yeah. sounds kind of cool. And, you know, 10, ni- 10 days later, I was on the air doing a Sunday night show, you know, Steve Gorman Sports. And I, believe me, I, when I turned on that mic the first time, I, I literally went, oh, oh <laughs> yeah. wait. That's a common <laughs> I'm not sitting thing. in on someone else's show. This is my show. What the, <laughs> what the hell did I get yeah. myself into? You know? oh, uh, what do I but, say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it was a little, it was a little like, oh, I'm in over my head here. But, you know, it's good to be in over your head. Yeah. My first, my first time on the air, I was the last guy in the building. And they literally yeah. came into the production. Hey, uh, you want to be on the air? I'm like, yeah, someday. No, now. <laughs> oh. okay. That's how it happens, uh, man. That's how it happens. Yeah, I mean, oh, I so mean, funny. Phil Ramone was sweeping the studio floor and making sandwiches, and you know, and one day, and the he guy came out. Yeah, he moved up the ladder. That's how actually Don LaFontaine, the movie trailer voice guy, you know, the big voice, uh, yeah. the guy who coined in a world and you know, a game of cat and mouse. All that guy that died a couple of years back. Yeah, he. Uh, that's his story. He was just in the right place at the right time. The voice guy. He he wrote movie trailers. Yeah, and he said, "Hey, Don." the guy that we hired is late. Why don't you come on in and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, at least do a scratch track and you know, the rest was history. You could actually, he was good at it. Yeah. He set crazy. the bar. Crazy. He set the bar in a oh world. Gosh. Yeah, Everybody he, imitates yeah, that genre. guy. So, um, yeah. so Steve, you also are, I, your drums might be parked right next to mine at drum paradise. You got a kid over there for sessions over at I Harry's place. Kids over there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, I got a bunch of stuff over there. So, you know, outside of the crows, you played on Bob Dylan records, Jack Cassidy, Joe Firstman, John Corbett, Bo Bice. Is this something that you, do you enjoy? Do you pursue it? Or is it mostly like it kind of lands in your lap? People are like, let's get that sound. Call that guy for a couple of tracks. The, well, the, st- uh, the in the nineties, it would just be like the Bob Dylan track and the, you know, the Jack Cassidy album. And I, I didn't do a lot in the nineties. I was just, it was just nothing but crows. Yeah. But occasionally, but that would just be a producer would call and say, Hey, you'd be great for this. Do you want to do it? And I would always say, I'd always said, yeah, but people don't call when you're a touring drummer in a band, you know, when you're like a member of the band, it's my band. It's like, you know, I, I mean, not for, com- not comparing myself to Charlie Watts, but nobody calls Charlie Watts and says, do you want to play on a session? You know, it's just like, <laughs> he's in the stones. You know what yes. I mean? It's like, right. And there are drummers. If I'd lived in LA all those years in the nineties, I probably would have done a lot of that. But in Atlanta, there wasn't a whole lot of call, but Brendan O'Brien lived in Atlanta, for example. Ah. And he was producing, he was working with Dylan and he called me and said, Hey, come play on this track. Yeah. Um, I, when I got to Nashville in Oh four, I definitely jumped right in and started doing some sessions here. I, I knew a few producers and I got really busy in Oh four and Oh five. And then when I went back, when the crows got back together and started touring again, you know, all of a sudden half the year's gone and I still would get calls over the, you know, 2006, seven, eight, I was doing sessions a couple of months though, you know, cause people would call. I was usually out of town. And when I was in town, um, oftentimes I was like, I just, no, I, I don't, I, I'm just sitting here with my kids or what, you know, sure. touring musician doesn't jibe in as well. And I wasn't the kind of guy, like I wasn't going to 
just crack the whip on myself and call producers constantly to stay in there on, you know, I'm not front of mind and that was okay with me. Um, yeah. But that said, I, I, I love doing sessions. It's always been fun to me to get into a room with people you don't know and figure something out real fast. I mean, I dig <laughs> that. Um, and it's very, you know, and plus in Nashville, it's like, I learned right away, like what it sounds like in the room sometimes has nothing to do with what the finished product is, but it's, sure. a, it's an amazing experience. And obviously the players are just crazy. You know, it's like, you know, I've always walked in there like, I love being the biggest tack in a room. This is going to be fun, you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, I always enjoyed it. And it's great to hear somebody else's stories you haven't heard a thousand times. You know, sure. it's always good. It's yeah. a fine way to pass the time. But I never pursued it. Yeah. Um, you know, once I started touring again, I didn't, I didn't give a whole lot of effort towards it. And then once I started doing radio, um, Steve Gorman Sports by 2011 was – five days a week. And, you know, I, I just took myself out of that circuit completely. Yeah. Do you have a where, setup at the house else? where you can record? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a studio in the back and I've got one, I've got one kit set up at all times. And I think I have three kits back there. I can switch, you know, I have a couple on the side just cause you have to, Yeah. uh, you know, yeah, you and can then, have modern, you can have stuff, vintage, uh, yeah, the rest of my stuff's things. over at, uh, yeah. the rest is all over at Harry's. Sure. And, I, and I keep saying I'm going to get rid of a lot of this gear. And then I'm down to the point now where I clearly cannot part with anything I still have. You know, I mean, okay. I've got I, I, and I'm, I don't think of myself as a gearhead or a huge collector. But, you know, there was a time when I was like, do I need 14 drum kits? I mean, honestly. Right. You know? Yeah. And the answer was no, I really don't. <laughs> um, they, they would be much better served somewhere else than sitting in a place collecting dust. Yeah. Jim, did you have a question for Steve? I was actually curious about, are you still recording in Nashville, the radio show, or doing it five days a week there? Have yeah, we well, Steve Gorman, Rock, well, Steve Gorman Sports went through the September 2018, and then we shut that down. I, I, I very truthfully just got burnt on Sports Talk. Um, it was a yeah. lot of fun, and I, you know, my cousin was my co-host, and we had a great time together. Um but it, 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 you know, the last almost five years was on a national network on Fox Sports Radio. And that's a very different racket than just doing it locally to, yeah. to have a laugh for the most part. You know what I yeah. mean? Like my local show was a complete, it was like a sketch comedy show more than anything else. We were just trying right. to amuse ourselves. And the national show, it is kind of like, well, I guess we should actually talk about sports every now and again. <laughs> you get to a point where, uh, but I, I, I didn't have that burning, you know, people that do that, the other people on my network, that's their primary job. That's their thing. That's what they have spent their lives preparing for. And I'm a rock drummer who came in the side door late to the party. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I got on national radio <laughs> when I was 49, 48 years old. And yeah. it was always, it was, it was a primary thing, but not really. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rock drummer. I'm a musician. I'm doing other things. It was things. fun, right? Yeah. And it was yeah. a lot of fun. It's a hobby and, that pays we, sort of well. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I mean, it was all good. It's like, yeah. man, the wheels were well greased, but, um, you know, but that's not my, it's not my passion. And, and I never right. kidded myself about that. And, uh, and after four and a half years, it was like, this is, this has been great, but yeah. I'm going to get back into some things that are, are, are really the kind of things that are, you know, I'd rather be up all night out of excitement than sitting around dreading another football season where I have to pretend to care about, you know, all 32 teams in the NFL. Yeah. Yeah. Four, four years in radio probably took about 20 years off your life. That's, that's about right. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, <laughs> and from, from start to finish, Steve Gorman Sports, the first time we did one was in 2008. Um, and it was sporadic for a few years, but from 2011 on, it was, it was five days a week for, you know, Grind. the better part of eight years. So that how many hours were, was it three, four hours? It, was, show it was two and then two for a few years. And then it was three and then it was two again. And, um, it's a long you know, it time. just, it, it was enough. It was enough. And then I took a year off. Um, I finished the book. I was, I started writing the book. And so the, the first thing I did when we stopped doing Steve Gorman sports is I was like, okay, I can just focus on the book nonstop here and knock and, and finish this. So that was right. uh, probably six or eight months finishing the book. And then the editing, pro you know, once I turned in this 900 page manuscript, then it's time to edit it, you know? And so that, and that yeah. took months. Yeah. Um, who's, who's your ready, who's your writing partner? You have, you go way, way back with Steve, Steven, Steven Hyden. He's yeah. a music writer. I've been a fan of for years. We just met in 2013 and um, 
and he was, uh, I just always liked his writing and we got to be buddies. And, um, you know, I, I called him in, I said, look, I'm going to write this book. I can write, but I don't know. I don't know how to write a book. Like I can open up my laptop and sit there for eight hours and write till the cows come home, <laughs> but I'm going to need some help shaping this. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. said, I, I, you know, just, I, I don't know what I'm asking Second you to set do, of yeah. but let's yeah. just, let's just, fit. and he'd never written with someone else. He's his own writer. Yeah. And he came up with a, a perfect plan as it turned out. He said, well, let's, you know, let's just establish the storyline to begin with. Like, like, let's sit down. So he and I got together over a bunch of weekends and he just recorded me telling the story of the band. I have a really linear chronological memory. And we started in 1987. The one thing we both agreed on was let's just start when I moved to Atlanta. I'm not going to bore people with my family background yeah. and all that. Yeah. And so we just told the whole story. I mean, I, he would prompt me and then I can just go and go and go. So we had hours and hours of me telling the story and he got that transcribed. And from that, we just broke it out into chapters. Like, okay, chapter one, will start here and it'll go to here. And we put together, we did like the Cliff's notes first. Yeah. If that makes sense. You know, we sure. had a little outline yeah. with my bullet points. So every chapter is a couple hundred words long of bullet points. And then I would just sit down and say, okay, chapter one, it starts here, it ends here. These things are in the middle and then whatever else I can remember. And then I would just write and write and write it. And so then I would, you know, we just built the chapters that way. So, and, you know, I just, I would just send him every completed chapter. And when we had the whole story written, we turned it in and it was 900. And so he was kept saying, you're writing way more than they're going to want. And I was like, yeah, but that's what editing's for. I'm not going to edit myself as right. I write. Huh. Um, and so, you know, I, it, it was probably eight months of six to eight months of writing after we had mm. spent a few months getting it ready. And then the, where he really, you know, stepped up was when, when the editor said, this is about two thirds too long. And I was of course saying, it's perfect. It's gold. Every <laughs> page is don't touch it. <laughs> and Stephen, Stephen, who'd been don't reading it as in. Yeah, he'd been reading it as I was writing it, and he was already making mental notes of, okay, hang on, let's just keep yeah. the keep the overall thing flowing. So, you yeah. know, we ended up working really well together. I mean, I, I mean, the simplest way to say it, and it actually works, is, you know, I wrote the songs and he produced the album, and it was a really good partnership. Yeah, he 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 would say like, oh, this is a great story, very compelling, but it doesn't necessarily move the whole narrative forward. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No. and he, and 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 he would point out things like, you know, you got to give <laughs> the reader credit. They already know, like you've already established this particular essence of the band, or like as far as that story is good, but it doesn't tell a different story. But it doesn't give more insight than the same story did twenty, you know, five years earlier. Yeah, like two different sets of events, but they ultimately are telling the same story, if that makes sense in terms yeah. of, you know, what, what went sideways or what was great, or, you know, you just don't want to be too repetitive with things thematically, if you will. Yeah. So um, that, that was a huge help to me. You know, I, I've, I've said, um, you know, I could have, I could have done it without help, but it would have taken 10 years and I'd still be writing it right now. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, I didn't want to, I didn't want to release a box set first time out of the gate. You know what I mean? Like, let's just go the nice tight album, 10 songs. Yeah. I always, uh, I always say if you get sticky fingers over XL on main street. You know what I mean? Like the, the extra stuff's great. And, yep. and I'm and the diehards might love that, but give me 10 crisp, perfectly constructed songs every time. For sure. I got to ask. What, and I'll, I'll say one thing too. Sorry. But the one, one of the guys from the publishing company, the best thing he said was just remember this. Nobody ever recommends a book. They don't finish. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. bingo. Yeah. yeah and I consumed it in one sitting, you know, and I think about all the stories that are, that, that are on the cutting room floor. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLSconsumeraccess.org. 
Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. Thinking about this one story, I'm trying to remember who it was in the band, but somebody in the band at one point had a hundred thousand dollar a year weed habit. Mm -hmm. Is that right? As far as he knew, yes, that was a guesstimate. Yeah. Oh, it was a guesstimate, um, and that wasn't even yeah. that was just weed. Is yeah. that a lot? That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot in 1994. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it's even more Two grand a week. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, there was a lot going on. Those, yeah. th those were some heady times to be sure. Yeah. I mean, and just the fact that you can get like, that was the, it was essentially one of the velvet rope eras of the music business and to come out on the other side without an insane amount of, of, of bad habits and addiction. It's a make good on you, man. You had that kind of the, well, the uh, I mean, I, I strength of character. <laughs> I talk a lot about addiction in the book and that, yeah. that's to me, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I, I mean, that's just the luck of the genetic draw with me. Yeah. Um, uh, is, and there's that. And then there's also a part of it that is I'm, I was from a family that, like I said, I was the eighth kid in a family. I grew up, you know, when you're, my dad was a former Marine. He had eight kids, six boys. We called our house, the barracks. You know what I mean? There wasn't sure. a lot of, wasn't a lot of uh, wasn't a lot of free form going on in the Gorman household. There was a system in place yes. to get everybody up and dressed and out the door on time, and it was <laughs> it was it was pretty militant. Um, I grew up waiting in line. You know what I mean? When you're the eighth kid, you're not getting that first. You know, you're not getting the Captain Crunch first. You're getting you, you gotta <laughs> wait till everyone else has poured their bowl. <clears throat> so I didn't I didn't go into these things with. I, I didn't approach when the band, when the first record blew up, you know, nobody expected us to sell millions of records. That was not our goal. It was not our, we didn't know that was possible. Um, but I think because of the family I was from and because I had, you know, I'd already, I'd gone to college for a few years. I just had a few life experiences that the other guys didn't have. So I didn't immediately assume my life began when Shake Your Money Maker was released. I didn't have a sense of, okay, everything before this didn't matter. I mean, the first gig I ever played in a club where my drum kit had a PA, at, you know, where there was a microphone and a kick drum. Yeah. That's still the most amazing night of my life on a certain level. Like your first time, the first time I kicked a kick drum and heard it go like yes. in a club, I, that was it. You know, yes. that's like. What was the first time for you, Rich? Thanks for reminding me of that, man. I mean, I'm sure there was. I'm sure there was some little things in Connecticut and Texas, but first thing that kind of comes to mind was this um, band in college called Eskimo Pie, and we would, would we would throw out Eskimo pies to all the drunks, but we played like all like British invasion music, and it was yeah. When you hear your 24 inch kick drum in a club that seats a thousand PA. people, yeah, you're like, yes, I have arrived. And I was Tuxedo I, it Junction. Was it was where. Tuxedo Junction in Danbury, Connecticut. All Danbury. Right. Yeah. My, for, there was a club in Atlanta called the Dugout. I was the doorman and uh, my, my band, my first band, when I moved down to Atlanta, I was starting a different band. It wasn't the Crows. This band called Mary My Hope. And we played the Dugout opening for Mr. Crow's Garden. That was my first gig. Um, I bought my kid in March. This was May of 87. And the guy said, okay, and you know, it's the first time you ever hear a song, go, okay, kick drum. And I'm sitting at the drum kit and I'm like, yeah, what about it? <laughs> yeah, literally, he goes, can Here I it hear it? Can I? <laughs> <laughs> and my guitar player, Clint, my buddy who had called me uh, six months earlier and said, do you want to start a band with me? 
he looked at me and goes, no, he's getting the sound. Just, just kick the kick drum. I go, oh, okay. And I just went, boo, boo, boo. And it was the fourth one. He turned it on. So it went, boo, 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 boo. Yeah. And it was like the guns of Navarone. I literally just, and, and clearly the look on my face, I couldn't be cool because the three guys in my band all just burst out laughing, looking at me, you know, and I was like, and I was kicking it going, oh my God, oh my God, so you know, it was, it was cool. done. I, it was yeah, over. Yeah. And then the first time I hit, hit it with a crash, the first time I heard myself make that amplified I mean, I, I, I honestly have goosebumps right now describing it. it That's was great. So, oh, my God. It was overwhelming to me, you know. I mean, to yeah. see so many bands for so many years and then to finally realize, like, oh, my God, I'm doing this. This is the thing I'm here to – I've been trying to figure out how to do for all these years. It was great. Yeah. And in your first trash can ending, that always just feels so good. Like, oh, oh yeah. my God, now they're going to follow me. Yeah. And they all ended with me. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. Did you have any, oh, yeah. did you get locked up in your first gig? You know, where you get a little too nervous? And then he happened. Um, only the first song. I, 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 I was like, I, we played our first song and I remember when it ended going like, <laughs> like yeah. breathe, remember to breathe. Dumbass. Yeah, my arms, know, um, my arms turned into fricking I beams when I started the fricking first song. You know, I, like, I, I didn't yeah, have well, that. Oh my God. You got to warm up, Jim. You got to do singles and doubles. I did, but the nerves got to me, man. The first show, yeah. I didn't have any of that. I There were some shows in that first year, though, where, yeah, you're. I'm in my second song, and I'm like, why are my arms turning into metal pipes right now? What's <laughs> happening to my forearms, you know? And, yeah. And, 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 I, and I was... It's always embarrassing. You know, I'm already playing gigs in clubs, and I literally know nothing. And so I, I would, I would have to feel out another drummer before I would ask them for help. Like, I was, is this guy cool? Is he going to make fun of me? You know. And then I would eventually be like, "So, do you do any warm up stuff? Like, do you ever get cramps?" And they'd look at me like, "What the hell is wrong with this guy?" You know. But I, yeah. I always had to play it cool. Yeah, Fred. There's a I knew guy I kind of arrived, there, there, not arrived, but I mean, I, I knew I was good at playing live in front of a crowd. Mm -hmm. When we would open up for uh, other bands, and one of the bands we opened up for back in the day was a band called Rock Alley, and they were, you know, glam as glam can be. So yeah, they were. I had my my giant kit set up in front of the guy's double bass kit, and I go out there and I do a sound check real quick, and he's he just comes up behind me and he had to show me up, and I was like, whatever, dude. <laughs> you know, sure. That's fine. You know, do you do yeah. your rocks falling and your your sneakers in a freaking dryer fills? That's yeah, fine. right. I'll, I'll do my Neil feels okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I can hold my own at that point. Yeah, but Neil didn't do a lot of like the the hand and foot combat. He did more of like the around the yeah. drums in, in little, eight, little, eight, yeah. eight seconds. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, I, the, the falling rocks was Tom Sawyer, but yeah, yeah. Who were your heroes, Steve, I, growing up? Like, you obviously listen to a lot of R&B music. Yeah, but it's all Ringo. I mean, he's number one, Alpha and the Omega, and still is. Do, 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 do. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's not even so much the parts. It's the sensibility that I, I really, it's stamped in my brain so deep as a little kid. Just like, yeah. this is what drummers are supposed to do, you know? Um, yeah. you, you, if it, if you lose the swing for one beat, the song's over. It's like, it's yeah. about feel, 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 feel. Um, and I, so I, I listened to the Beatles records so much. I mean, I mean, from the age of six to 10, really nothing else every day, all the time, air drumming along. And it just established such a sense of that kind of feel. You know, I was listening to other stuff, but I was studying Beatles records without realizing it. Um, and then what, what I did start listening to, if I did put on an Al Green record or if I did put on even an Earth, Wind & Fire record or whatever, you know, I wasn't the kid that studied the liner notes to figure out who was drumming on it. I just was way more interested in just listening to the drummers. And I did always have a sense of what drummers weren't doing and how impactful that was. I mean, I really did get this. I remember being in, you know, 12, 13, 14 and, and my drumming brain would always pick up on, Oh, he left a hole there. And, oh, he only did that fill the last time. He didn't. The thing, I loved a lot of Ringo's tracks because like ticket to ride is such a great example to me of like, you know, there's this stop in ticket to ride where it's, it comes out of the chorus every time there's the pause 
So she want to do right, uh, you know, and it's like, well, I'm take it right. she's got to take it to ride. Right. And the first one, he goes, and then the second one is dig it, dig it, dig it. And then the third one is just plop. You know, nice. it gets simpler each time. And yeah, the first one was like, like two double stipe, like, like yeah. that's tricky. But, but, but just the idea that it was each time got simpler as opposed as, to each time getting more complicated. Yeah. Which is yeah. the, which it is was the more pitfall. impactful. Yeah. It was just more impactful to just that last time when it's just plop, that's it. It's just a which, and it's, it's incredible like, that you were born, I believe one year after the Ed Sullivan, yeah. you know, the, the madness yeah. where the Ludwig drum company couldn't keep the drums in stock. Yeah. And then you were a Ludwig guy, weren't you forever and ever? Or still are you? I, I no, I was, I didn't get a Ludwig kit till 95. Um, uh-huh. But, but this, and it was the kind of thing where, so Ringo was my lifelong guy. And then I had a bunch of bands I loved and I liked all those drummers. But when I first bought my kit, that's the first time I really dug into Led Zeppelin. Like I'd heard them on the radio my whole life. But the first time I put on Led Zeppelin one with headphones, I, I was sitting at a drum kit going, Oh, Oh, okay. You know, like, Oh, really paying attention. But I, I knew two things. I can't do any of this. And this makes perfect sense to me. This, this was, to me, Bonham was the first guy that made me think of Ringo. And it was just all that swing. You know, it was so much bounce in their play. Yeah. And so they much weren't space. a rock band. They were a funk band. I mean, they yeah, there's a lot of so much influence. space in between his own foot and left hand. You know, it's just, mm-hmm. it's hard to describe. But I, I, I felt the same way I felt when I would listen to certain Ringo tracks, listening to Led Zeppelin. And so those are always my two guys and then it was in the summer of or fall of 95 i went into a music store and there was this ringo reissue kit and i started playing it and it just sounded so great and i was like what why have i not been playing ludwig this whole time like wait this is the (laughs) dumbest thing on earth and and i believe it's in the book but you met you got to meet ringo and tell him what how especially was what right yeah, yeah, we're we're yeah. kind of chums at this You're point. Like, well, he, he, it's pretty he, amazing. You text buddies. He send you like crazy memes. Yeah, or he. Uh, yeah, and and last <laughs> summer, um, I went to see him at the Ryman. I got my son got to meet him, which he was you know over the moon about. Nice. It was it was actually really cool because he met Ringo, and got a photo with him, and then the next day he went to college. And so I dropped him off at Indiana University, starting his freshman year of college. It's a big deal. Sure. And we walk into his room, and his roommate had already gotten there, and on a, he already put up a Beatles poster. <laughs> and I was That's like, a- and I just saw it, and 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 then to only to my son, I would have never done this. I said, "Hey, man, do you want me to show him the picture of you with Ringo?" And my son's like, "Dad, don't do that. You know, like, <laughs> don't make this weird." And I'm just torturing my kid by threatening. I, to do I that. mean, but, IU uh, is a big music school. Is your son in music? Is he studying music? He's not, but oh, yeah, yeah, it is very much a big music school now. Yeah, but he went to Kenny Aronoff did a thing there. Did a did, was, he, he had a class where Kenny came and spoke and. And of course he told me, he goes, Hey, do you know Kenny Aronoff? I said, Oh yeah, you gotta, I said, go up and tell him you're my kid and he owes me 20 bucks, you know, or something. And he did. Yeah. And of course, Kenny was just like, you know, they gave him, a, you know, I can't even remember what Kenny said, but we all know it was, it was blue and funny and, and he had a great time with him. So yeah, we just had, we just we had him on. It was so, it's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he was a hero growing up. You're a hero growing up. And I love the, just how life works out and, you know, we can, we can connect on these things and you wrote a book and you probably didn't even have to see your co-author one time. Was that all from afar? Did you guys ever get together? Oh no. I mean, I, I, it's, I mean, me, you know, we, we got together just to get it laid out the first time, but then I, I, you know, I, like I said, I, I would, I wrote it. And then when it was time to actually go back in, like we sent it to the publisher and he said, uh, look, I'm not editing this. You guys edit this. If I try to cut this up, you'll hate me, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so, no, Steve lives in Minneapolis and I'm in Nashville. And so we would just, he immediately said, let me just, okay, we got 900 pages. Let me just immediately take 200 of these off the table. Cause I've already know and he, and he, you know, we're, we're on the phone. He goes, okay, you know, this whole part, you know, that whole part, you know, that whole part, they can all come out and I'll tell you why, because you've already established this precedent and right away. And I wasn't too precious with any of it. Once I knew we had to cut it, I was like, sure. You know, there's an entire chapter, a standalone whole chapter on its own that we took out. And it's a really funny story about a lawsuit that we were involved in where a guy sued us and we were on court TV for two weeks. Oh my God. But, but it, but like, as you said earlier, it doesn't move the whole narrative along. It's just a crazy episode. 
And so that was an easy one to pull out. So like right there, it was like, okay, great. There's 8,000 words. Get rid of that. You know, sure. it doesn't yeah. do anything other than it's, and it's, and it'll surface somewhere one day. I might just yeah. put it on Facebook. Hell, I don't care. It's really yeah. crazy. But, um, you know, it, it was so no, we didn't have to, we were never together, like in the same room for any of that stuff. We're just, yeah, I just you know, love how technology exists and we can do this and connect and we could even keep oh, the yeah, entertainment yeah. coming during a pandemic. Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. One of the things we'd like to do with the show is kind of bring things into the world of, you know, motivation, success, education, business. Jim is a, you know, a serial entrepreneur. Do you have a question, Jim, a business question? I do. I, I was curious about, you know, the formation of the band and having the wherewithal to have, I mean, you seem very business savvy now, but, you know, back then I would imagine that there were a seed kind of germinating towards that business savviness now. Um, did you guys have like the in impetus to have a, an operations agreement, you know, kind of thing to go along with equal share in the band and all that stuff. Uh, it, it was not, anything like that? In- by the, we did like towards the end of the first tour cycle, you know, we, we said everybody's, you know, it's a band we're, yeah, we're equals, right. you know, the, the brothers we're, we're a business songs. essentially. Yeah. 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 Uh, the Robinson brothers were writing all the songs, you know, and right. that was always just, okay, that's your world. You guys, you know, uh, to this day, I can go about nine seconds on publishing and then it gets confusing to me. Right. Um, I, you know, uh, and, and like I've, I've written songs with other people for other things. My band Trigger Hippie, there's a, you know, but I know what I need to know, but it's not much. So that was an easy thing. They're, they write all the songs. Right. Everything else was, we're all partners. You know, nice. that was just established right. early on. Um, once we were touring, once we'd sold a few million records, you know, our manager who we had met right before the album came out, he asked once about, Hey, uh, do do you guys have a partnership agreement? And we all went, what's that? You know, he was like, yeah, let's, let's put something down on paper that explains what this is. And so then we did. And, you know, it was always from that point forward, it, it was always, yeah. I mean, we knew this was the business. We were very fortunate. Like I said before, we had a great manager who, we trusted, we had a business manager, you know, an accountant that we trusted. And there's not an, uh, an, there's not one example in the history of the black crows where you could say somebody took advantage of us. You know, they could have very easily truth be told, but thankfully no one did. Well, I mean, it's, uh, I'm kind of in a, you know, business right now where we've got three partners and we all, you know, we make sure we know where we all stand based on an operational agreement, you know, when Mm -hmm. success ensues and, you know, things can happen and, you know, success amplifies personalities, you know, it amplifies the characteristics of our personality that we may not be aware of. Yeah. Um, So, I mean, I read the article about 2015 when, you know, everything kind of, you know, they, they wanted to have, um, a, a more of a majority share, I guess, of the business that had involve a had to involve a buy down or something. But did they just go ahead and dissolve? The well, business? no. Well, they, it wasn't they. It was just Chris, our singer, just decided right. if we were going to do this 25th anniversary tour, it's time for him to say, "I need all the money." I mean, it was absurd. Um, wow. Um, and he wasn't suggesting anything. It was just some completely bizarre power grab that went nowhere. I mean, he suggested. Right. He, he laid all these terms on me and his brother, the guitarist, Rich. Um, and, and, and he said, these are non-negotiable. Do this or we're not touring. And we said no. And that was it. He was like, oh, okay. See you yeah. later. Yeah. Um, wow. It was real, real simple in that regard. Um, so, you know, I, we can spend years trying to figure out what the hell that all was. It was some combination of ego and rage and, and addiction and all these various things. Um, if we had agreed to any of his terms, just to answer the point, if, yeah. if he had suggested something that we then agreed to, yeah, of course. I mean, the lawyers were, it wasn't long before lawyers are on every other business call. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. you know, we, like I said, and, and thanks to Pete Angelus, our manager, he understood very clearly. I mean, he had been with Van Halen. He started with them at the Whiskey A Go Go when they were an unsigned band. <laughs> yeah. And he managed to, you know, he went from being their quote unquote creative director and lighting director. He directed all their videos. He was the fifth member of the band. And then by the time they're on tour for 1984, he's essentially managing the band. And then they kick Dave out and he stays with Dave and manages him through two albums, which were huge, you know, yeah. with Greg Bissonette in that sure. band and Steve Vai. Yeah. And then, and then he had just, you know, he started, he's an 18 year old college freshman running a spotlight at the Whiskey A Go Go. And then 14 years later, he's 
managing the Black Crows and David Lee Roth. I mean, it worked. <laughs> I, I would say 99% of bands don't have an operating agreement until it's almost too late or they, or someone comes along and says, hey, you got to get this done. But yeah. usually yeah. the person that's, that says you got to get this done is someone who's in a position to take advantage of a band. And so that seems right. it's so cool that you had a guy that worked out all the kinks with a major band, had a, a, yeah. a flow, and had your best interest in at heart. Uh, w- yeah. he, he talked about a 20-year plan from the day we met him. That's great. And within two years, it was a 30-year plan. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it was, you know, he said, we literally hired him like in late December of 89. The record came in early February. I mean, we had less than six weeks from the time we said, you're a manager to having a record in stores. Yeah. And we had to, you know, when we first met him, it was, we played a gig. It was December 20th, 1989 a showcase in, in, in Atlanta. We, the cotton club in Atlanta gave us a Sunday night. They didn't have anything booked. The guy that owned it was so cool. Cause we're like, we got a manager coming in. Can we play? And he said, man, I'll help you out. I'll make it free. And the first draft beers free. We had 12 people, oh, wow. 12 people showed up. Like yeah. we were hardly a big commodity in Atlanta, Georgia, 1989 sure. at the end of the year. But you know, we met Pete that night and he was like, so who's your agent? And we literally were like, what's an agent? He goes, okay. Uh, do you have a publicist? And we were like, no, nope. do, we literally have nothing. There's you're looking at everything right here. Yeah. We and then most people producer. would be like, <laughs> yeah. And he was, he was great. He was great. Really? He was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And, and we had met other managers. Other people came to see the band and they were such managers. They were all LA you know, they were trying to impress us. And he, Do just, shoot. he looked right at us and said, well, you guys have a lot of work to do, but I like, I see so much potential, but you're not good yet. You're not a good band live. You're not, you made a great record. You are not as good as your record. And we got to get first. And he said, before we do anything, we got to get you as good as your record. That, wow. that nothing's going to happen until that happens. And, the and we said, well, how do we do that? And he said, I'm going to put you on the road for a year. And that was literally all we needed to hear. That's all we ever wanted. Like, we okay. just wanted to get on the road. He goes, I'm going to put you out yeah. and you're going to open for every band we can get you out on. And I, you're never going to come home again. And we'll see where we are in a year. And to, honestly, it was like that, that was the equivalent of waving a million dollars in our face. You know, there was uh, no money in it. We went have, into debt. Have- we yeah. went so yes. into debt every year to every week. I mean, to the label because record companies used to give tour support. What a wild concept! Yeah. yeah, but but we honestly didn't care about that. And then when we did hire him, he said, "Well, I've seen the deal you signed. It's the worst deal I've ever read personally. It's worse than any deal I've ever heard about. You will never make a nickel from Shake Your Money Maker. I don't care how many copies it sells. You're never going to make money." And we were sitting there, and he goes, "So." your job is to go become a great band. And my job is to figure out how the hell we're going to get out of this deal. And we said, okay. And we trusted him from the jump and it was a good decision because he was phenomenal. I mean, any other manager would have quit after five years of dealing with the insanity of our band. And he got you out of the deal. He did. He did. He, uh, you know, he was the guy who, it was, a, you know, it was a little bit of luck. Uh, it was a new label. Rick Rubin had started this rock label called Deaf American. They didn't have all their ducks in a row. And they, we were the first album that sold copies. Like they suddenly they had a staff, you know, like they were making so much money from Shake Your Money Maker that he could go hire a label. Like he could wow. bring people in. And at some point, uh, nobody recognized that they had to pick up the option for the second album within a year of the release date. So in February of 91, the record had just gone platinum and Pete was like, if we get to February 13th and they haven't picked up the option, we're free agents. And so we're all sitting there like, Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. And then they, they didn't pick up the option and he was able to go, you know, put a vice grip on the labels nuts and get everything back. (laughs) That's uh, sweet karma. You know what he did? He went to Sony. He went to Sony records and said, what do you give the black crows right now? And this is as we were selling a million records a month. I mean, we were the biggest new band, like, I guess, Guns N' Roses, and then there'd been a few others. But for the for the fall of 90 and spring of 91, we were the biggest new band in the world. Um, yeah. This is before Nirvana and Pearl Jam. You know what I mean? We, we had that lane to ourselves for about six months. And it was Metallica during that time. Had released, 
their Black not yet. album yet? No, not yet. That was this is was... before that. All the yeah. fall of '91, a ton of records all came out, but they yeah. hadn't happened yet. So we had the spring to ourselves, and in rock. And uh, he went to Sony and said, "What do you give the Black Crows?" And so they just, of course, Sony's like, "Well, here's a <laughs> crazy deal," you know. <laughs> And he took it back to our original label. It was a tiny label and we didn't want to be on Sony. You know, we didn't want to have suddenly have a, you know, a Madison Avenue suit telling us what to do. We wanted yeah. to stay on a small label, but he went back to Rick Rubin and said, you got to match this deal that Sony just offered me or we're gone. And Rick said, sure, no problem. And he said, but you got to make it retroactive for the first album. And, you know, and Rick was, he didn't want to be the guy that lost the black crows. So he said, okay. And so it turned everything around like overnight, all of a sudden we were like, Hey, we're going to get money for selling records. This is awesome. Yeah. Well, he's a savvy yeah. business person too, Rick Rubin. Oh, he That's very much is. Yeah. No, Rick, yeah. I'd say Rick's done pretty well for himself. Rick's doing oh, yeah. good. Yeah. Just living yeah out and, out and that Slayer. wasn't Rick's mistake. I mean, that's, that's Rick's attorney. That's some attorney he hired, not paying attention to the contract. It's not like Rick yeah. was the guy that forgot the option. That was the furthest thing from his mind. <laughs> oh no, that guy They're got never going to catch this. that lawyer got an earful for sure. And then the other thing yeah. that I noticed, just kind of looking back, is that the re the rest of the guys in the band were like raiding seventies thrift shops and getting corduroys and Indian beads. And you're like, I'm going to yeah. wear suits. Like you always had a button up yeah. shirt or a blazer. It was cool, man. Well, that, that started on the second record. I was wearing just like jeans and whatever on the first record. But, you know, uh, you know, it's funny. The thing about the Black Crows, one thing that was great about the Black Crows is every one of us was over six feet tall. Wow. That's just, that's just cool. I'm sorry. I mean, you're a you tall know, drummer. It's very rare. It's like you, Chad yeah. Smith. It's a small group of guys. The rest of us, Simon I, Phillips types, were just like, like down <laughs> low, like Stallone. Hey. Well, and, and and that's where all that good that's where that uh, that stick speed and the foot you get around because you know you don't have these stupid ass long arms to contend uh. with. Um, no, we we were all over six feet tall, and I was you know I weigh uh, two hundred pounds, you know, and like I'm in a band with all these guys that weigh one hundred and forty pounds, and I was like, <laughs> I just didn't, and and it just it, there was always that thing of like. No one else probably cared, but I would just look at myself and I, I didn't go with bell bottoms and super flowery stuff, but I just was like, yeah. man, I just don't, this stuff just doesn't fit me. I don't feel like me, you know, yeah. a lot of the, you know, sure. I, you know, if it was jeans and a t-shirt and a leather jacket, that was fine. But anything beyond that, I was never going to get into. And so, but really what happened towards the end of the tour for the first album, I shaved the front half of my head, like to here. I just, one night just cut it, just completely shaved it. And then left it really long in the back. It looked insane, but it just made me feel good. And it was some measure of control because I was just like, I was ready to get home and we'd been on the road forever and things were really hectic. And in a weird way, that made me feel good to do that. And so when I came home from that tour, I suddenly went from, this is a cool, you know, I kind of look like this maniacal pro wrestler Manchurian bodyguard or something. And then I get back to Atlanta and the second I'm back home for a few months after 20 straight months on the road, I went, I just look like a fucking idiot at this point. I got to do something. <laughs> so, I, so I cut, so I cut it all off. And so I had really short hair Yeah. and, and we were getting ready to start shooting photos for the second album and do everything. And, and I just remember I was sitting at Chris's house and I said, man, I'm, I said, you know, and I, I, I know nobody's really going to care, but I just, I got this suit. I'm feeling suits, man. And, and, and he looked at me and goes, oh, that'd be great. And I go, yeah, I'm thinking, but I don't want to get like crazy. I just think like a good businessman suit, you know, something. And it was, and of all the people, Chris was like, yo, oh, man, that'd be awesome. Go for it. Like we were yeah. laughing about it. And, and the truth is, and so I literally went to like men's warehouse. I didn't go to the Nordstrom Gucci. I went to like straight men's warehouse. I said, give me like mm -hmm. an olive drab basic suit. And as soon as I put it on, I was like, oh, this is, this is perfect. You know, it's yeah. like, and I look back now, if I'd so been the kind of person who thought about, if I thought about branding and if I'd been thinking about my career, I would have never changed that look. You know, it'd be like Slash's top hat. It would have just yeah. always been that guy in the suits and the, and the short hair. I mean, back but then I, it was I, like, I, uh, I just didn't think that way back then at all. It was like was chest like, king. There was years. like shoulder pads, right? Like big shoulder pads. Yeah. It was a different cut. The suits had a different cut back then. Mine? 
Well, no, just in the '90s, I remember there being like <laughs> oh, shoulder awesome. pads, and there was they were yeah. like olive mustard. Well, you're you're, you're kind of, of wearing uh, uh, sports coats in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What it looks like. Yeah, I mean, were they was, tough to play in? No, I well then I actually got some made um, yeah. that were I wouldn't have worn anywhere but on stage. I started going with some pinstripe suits; they could nice. really pop. You could see the colors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I had I had jacket and uh, and pant combinations that were just for the stage. They looked amazing from from the crowd. And if you got up close, you were like, "Those things are nasty." You know? <laughs> that is not matchy matchy. <laughs> yeah. They don't they don't match perfectly. They're wearing out. The buttons. Are, How many no even button? The, all the buttons have fallen off. You know what I mean? It was like, but it looked great on stage. Yeah. How many performances would one outfit last? Man, I tell you what, not as I mean, I was a I'm a big sweaty dude, man. Just me too. wailing away back there. So uh they 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 would give me, you know, I'd I'd get I'd I'd get through a whole tour cycle with, with a good right, with a couple you. of suits, but but how I many was, suits and replace them? Oh like one, one tour cycle dozen, would you probably fire. Oh, a couple dozen, really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Once I got because because the, the color, the pinstripe thing was pretty <clears> cool. Yeah. Well, maybe not. A, maybe a solid dozen. Maybe a good dozen or two. Yeah. No, I, I, it was a couple dozen. I'm, I, I can't. So, I can't talk myself out of this one. It was a lot. <laughs> so I think when I when I first met Rich, you were rocking the uh, the wallet chain with the uh, t shirt, yeah. right? Yeah, we were like a biker yeah. gang. Like every we all everybody in the band had wallet chains, and it, it was like you know, let's all uh, yeah, early but surely that was the thing to do. Yeah, well, we just go red. through cycles where it's like you maybe one tour you dress up, where it's like a lot, a lot of vests, and then there's another the vest for a while. Rock tea, you know, that you yeah. you pay way too much money for on Melrose Avenue, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Easy to do. Totally. I never knew what to wear. I would always do the Carter Beaufort thing and wear the hockey jersey, which my wife hated. Yeah, that's a tough one to sell the wife on. I know, I know, yeah. I'm sure. You know, hey, I'm the fat guy behind the drums. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you know what you what uh, you know what to do. We've got this our favorite part of the show. I know. Steve, I think you'll get a kick out of this. Right, hold on, here we go. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. So this is a random question from a random that, question. That's generator. what I hear. I hear it's a random <laughs> yes. question. Yes. Imagine that. Just you know, whatever the jingle says. When you were a kid, what silly thing were you deathly afraid of? What silly thing? Yeah. Um, well, my, I, 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 what's the silly thing I was afraid of? I, I, I don't guess looking back, you would be like, that's so stupid. Why was I afraid of that? Oh, well, I mean, I'm still afraid of snakes. I, I have a real snake thing. And that's, that's born. That's genetic. If I see a snake, I, I lose it. I, I don't want to be near them on any level. Uh, um, and my, my brain knows very clearly that's just a garter snake. It's not going to hurt you. And I am right. gone, man. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, I used to, uh, work at a record store in Atlanta, uh, called wax and facts and little five points. It's still there. It's still worth your time. Cool. And on Saturdays it would be packed. I tell my kids record stores used to be like the Apple store. Now <laughs> that's where, <laughs> that's where we used to go hang out and just be all day. But on Saturday, Except all the items morning. didn't look alike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There was a dude that would come in and he always had a giant boa constrictor around his shoulders and he would walk around little five points of that thing. And that dude would walk in the store and I would, I didn't, it didn't matter what I was in the middle of doing. I was up the stairs to the back, to the back area. I was like, uh-uh, I'm not getting within a hundred feet of that damn thing. Yeah. And it's illogical. And I totally get that, you know, nothing's going to happen, but I, I have a real snake thing. To this day, not a fan of snakes. No. That's, what was, about um, what about you, Rich? I, that, well, that is that goes into the four S's category. So you got snakes, scorpions, spiders, and sharks. I don't want anything to do with any of them. And being oh, the unstylish. Four the four S's. Yeah. yeah. Spiders yeah. and scorpions, you can step on. I have an S. And it's over. The, the, yeah, those, but if you're I sleeping. Those don't bug me. If you're sleeping and I they crawl into your mouth. S. or Yeah. I have a fifth S you can add to that list. What is that? What is that? Seaweed. I eat seaweed. Skeeves I'm fine with out. it. Yeah. Skeeves me out to this day. Really? No, you really? so sushi. They oh wrap my it in gosh. seaweed. No, but it like getting into a lake or an ocean, feeling the seaweed wrap around. Oh, oh. my God. Yeah, okay. God. Okay. Interesting. I can't do it. Fair enough. So, I, I, we'll, we'll let it, we'll let it bounce. Yeah. It's yeah. in play. I can see that. It's silly. So yeah. silly. 
Steve, this is a, it was really incredible to finally connect, man. I know, I know it's not in the flesh. I would love to have a cup of coffee over at Drum Paradise and just look at all of our kits and everything. But this is, uh, hey, this is, this is all right, man. Thank you so much for joining us. What, do you like to be found? How do people contact you? Are you on the socials, all that kind of stuff? I am on socials. My, uh, my Instagram is Steve underscore Gorman underscore. And my Twitter is SGSFOX, SGS Fox, which was original. That was Steve Gorman Sports Fox. Uh, and I just haven't changed it because who cares? You can, yeah. if you Google Steve Gorman Twitter, you can find me real easy. And if the, if the, uh, some, some new fans want to follow and your current radio show, where is, I, how? I was just getting to that. That yeah. is Steve, Steve Gorman Rocks on Facebook and Instagram. And then on Twitter, it's just Gorman Rocks. Killer. And that is a, uh, a classic rock show on Westwood One, five nights a week. It is five hours a night. And uh, we just play a ton of rock music, and I occasionally step on the mic and talk about it. So that's, right. that's that what I'm doing years. anyway. I might as well do it with some people. Listening. I'm listening to records and talking about music anyway. Why not yeah. do it for a show? You know? So how are you doing that so now? You're just doing it virtually? Like, uh, like the show Voice track or yeah we yeah no i'm i have a you know i have a, all the gear here at the house and nice. so um right. it was uh the you know the month of march was a little interesting as we were suddenly out of our studio and you know my producer and my co-host and i are like okay how are we going to do this now uh but we we didn't you know credit to my uh my producer sarah she she put together a good workflow and and uh, it's been a lot of fun so that show's been on the air i finished steve gorman sports september of 18. Um, it was a Friday, like September 7th. And then a year exactly like Monday, September 9th, a year later, I started Steve Gorman rock. So I had a year off of radio during which time I f finished writing the book and then trigger hippie put a record together. We, we recorded an album and that came out in October. That was the other thing. Trigger hippie was touring up until mid March. And then of course, like everybody else, we got, we got sent to the bench. Yeah. Um, that's been the, that's, that's a real drag because that's, you know, I, the record we put out last year, I'm very proud of, and the band was just cooking and it was all sitting there, you know, it just looked like, Oh my gosh, it's all lining up and here we go. And we're going to build this thing and, oh, or not, we'll just go yeah. home. Who's in the band? Trigger hip, trigger hippie. I love the name. Trigger hippie is uh, myself and, and the bassist is a guy named Nick Govrick from here in Nashville. And we've been playing together for 16 years. Um, everything we've ever done we is kind of under the, it started off being called Hey, Hey, Hey. <laughs> we used to go play at the family wash in East Nashville. Yeah. And, and we would, it was me, Nick, and whoever answered the phone first and said, yes, I'll come play with you tonight. We would just go jam. Nice. Uh, but out of that, we started thinking about a band and Nick's a great songwriter. So we had a ton of, 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 of original music if we ever put a band together to do it. So we, we had a revolving door. It was always the rhythm section is the only stable part of the band, which was oh, okay. always kind of the by design too, you know, like, like, you know, it's our rhythm section first and then the rest doesn't really matter. Whoever's available. Like that was kind of our joke. Uh, and we did that off and on. We put a record out in 2014, that lineup, Joan Osborne was on that album. She was singing with us at the time. Cool. And a guy named Jackie Green was playing guitar. And then our guitarist on that album was Tom Bukovac. Who nice. Is, you know, I'm sure you know Buk. He's, yeah, man. We, we'll end up on uh, a I was like, when I see him on a session, I'll be like, oh, it's going to be a good day. We're going to make some Yeah, good no, he's, he's, he's a, I, I could do a whole hour just on, on, on Bukovac. Yeah. Uh, but that wasn't a band that was ever going to be a real band. It was like a fun project for everybody. Yeah. But when that kind of came to an end, summer 15, Nick and I were like, if we're going to keep doing this, let's, let's make this a real band. Like this is where we wanted to really put our energy. And so we found um, a couple new folks, uh, Ed Jurdy and Amber Woodhouse and a kid named Saul Philcox joined us as the second guitarist. And, the album's available everywhere. It's called uh, Full Circle and Then Some. And um, like I said, I'm super proud of it. I love it. And one day, uh, <laughs> hopefully, some green flags will wave and we'll get back on the road. Take some music to the people. I got to check that out. Trigger Happy and the book is Hard to Handle, The Life and Death of the Black Rose, a memoir by Steve Gorman. Man, what a pleasure to connect with you, man. Thank you for joining us. It is a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you both. Absolutely. Jim. You. Jim, thank you for your time and talent, buddy. And uh, for the fans out there, we got an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. And if you're digging what we're doing, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Everyone have a great holiday season. Stay safe. See you next time. Thanks, Steve.
Cheers. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.